It was the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that produced leadership like we have currently today among us in the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. That's right. It is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that has produced leaders in the female form of a Minister Ava, a Mother Tanetta Muhammad, and others that have impacted not only the black community, but humanity as a whole. That's right. The future is all about our youth. This young brother coming up out of Mississippi, twirling down through Memphis, Tennessee, comes forward. He is a researcher. He's on the research team that gets the actual facts for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan when he prepares his many national and international presentations. This young brother has wrote books like The Dictionary of Supreme Wisdom, yes, which actually gives a definition of every single word found in our Supreme Wisdom lessons given to us by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. This young brother wrote books like Who Do They Say That I Am? which is a scriptural quote that Jesus asked his disciples, who do they say that I am? And of course, some said they say you are Elijah the prophet and other things. And then of course, finally, ultimately he asked them, who do you say that I am? That's right. He wrote books like Defending Farrakhan, Volume 1, 2, and they have enough material to even put together maybe a third. I'm talking about a young man only 18 years old, no, I'm exaggerating there. He looks like he's 18, 25, but he's a, at least in the 30 range. We'll just leave it at the 30 range. But at any rate, without any further delay, I bring before you this morning one of our own brothers, friends, soldiers in the struggle in the army of God, Brother Dimitri Muhammad. Oh, sir. In the most holy name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God except Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is indeed the messenger of Allah. We are forever and eternally grateful to Allah for his merciful intervention into the affairs of black people in America coming in the person of the great Mahdi, Master Far Muhammad, to whom praise are forever due. We thank Allah for coming and for raising among us one that is often described as a Georgia-born black man. One of us. Mm. Come on. The choice of God. He only went to the fourth grade in school. <clears throat> Completing the third, he didn't get a chance to complete the fourth. But at a certain point in his life, he indeed met a master teacher. That's right. And he exists today as Allah's messenger Messiah to us first and foremost, but in truth to the world. And that one is none other than the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's and we right. would not know any <coughs> of the things that I have just shared. If it was not for Almighty God Allah once again and his divine and providential hand sufficing need before we even perceive the need. That's right. And preparing for this generation of our people and the world what really constitutes a beautiful and marvelous extension mm. of the love, wisdom, and power that the world first became acquainted with in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But to the extent that many of us in this room, we were not around when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was crisscrossing America, writing articles on the radio, and ministering unto thousands of our people. So Allah provided for this generation an extension of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his special spokesman. Really, in truth, we could say his second self. I refer to none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. 
Beloved brothers and sisters, allow me to once again extend to each and every one of you the greeting words of peace and paradise of Assalamu alaikum. Well, well, as well, as well, I have to just say I'm so excited to be here in Columbus in the great state of Ohio, getting an opportunity to uh, be the guest of the believing community here. I thank the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for his blessing and guidance and for his permission to come into the communities that are under his stewardship as he represents the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so I'm always uh, very uh, cautious about making a mistake before the people of God. Mm. You know, you are so special in the eyes of Almighty God Allah that anyone that would have the privilege to share knowledge with your open heart and mind, that is something that you don't rush into. Right. It's something that you give due diligence to prepare for and something that you approach with due reverence. Mm. And so I'm grateful for all that have come out today uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, certainly thankful for our host minister, uh, my big brother and friend, mm -hmm. uh, student minister Donnell Muhammad. All right. All right. See, he doesn't realize that after this weekend, I'm gonna have to put him on my speed dial list <laughs> because as I travel around the country and I'm blessed to build uh, relationships and share brotherhood with the believers. I have found friends, I have found teachers, I have found mothers, I have found fathers, and those that can help me continue on this journey. And I certainly have found that in many of you, and especially your student minister, Minister Donnell, uh, Brother Michael, and some of the other representatives that were here yesterday, I think student minister Robert from Springfield. And so I'm very excited. Uh, yesterday we broached a new uh, topic within this uh, overarching subject called Defending Farrakhan. And I have to say that when we talk about defending Farrakhan, uh, first of all, the minister has not done anything of evil that he necessarily needs a defense for. Right. We have to make that clear. Yes, sir. You know, we're not seeking to defend a criminal, right, right, right. but to the degree that uh, no righteous man, no strong man or woman, no righteous woman for that matter, can live in a world of evil without coming up against the forces of evil. Right. It becomes incumbent upon those who are witnesses to their good oh, to stand right. in right. the hour of their crucifixion. <laughs> and I know that I'm in the room and in the presence of witnesses. Right, right, right. Because this world would always like to try to paint the servants of God and even the revolutionary strong men and women who are in and of themselves servants of God right, right. with a negative brush to demagnetize them in the eyes of the people. Right. And we bear witness that wherever the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan goes, he is magnetic. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I have blessed to be in a city, Stu Minister Donnell, in Memphis, Tennessee, where the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has visited often. And sometimes the minister would come in 48 hours' notice. And in 48 hours, the mosque would be overflowing with people in the streets. The magnetism of a man of God. But we are in an hour where great men and strong men and women are having their character assassinated. And so this leads into uh, part two of our discussion, smite the shepherd, scatter the nation. Mm. Now smite, I thought about it last night, Minister Dunn, I should have defined that word or cleared that word because that's old English. Mm. Smiteth thou this shepherd. And many of us, we don't do too well with modern English. You know? But in some of the English translations, they use a more modern term of strike the shepherd, 
we would say assault the shepherd, abuse the shepherd, because the shepherd and the sheep constitute a body mm -hmm. where the shepherd is the head. And if you can render a sufficient blow to the head, just like if you render a sufficient blow to my head or your head, then the body cannot live. So we want to get into uh, the slides. Uh, and I pray that Allah blesses us uh, to get over what we want to share today. As we are discussing, smite the shepherd, scatter the flock is a strategy. So just a brief uh, recap of some of the introductory points from yesterday for the benefit of those who may not have been blessed to be with us. As student minister Donnell mentioned, this emerges out of a verse of scripture in a dialogue between Jesus and his disciples. In Mark chapter 14 verse 27, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. To this we are reminded of the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad when he describes that even though we see a lot of different things taking place in such a world as this, the wicked who rule over this world, they have an ultimate aim and objective. Mm. They know that they have a limited time. They know that they were never promised perpetuity or eternity. Yes, right. But like any life force, it seeks to remain as long as it can, mm. and even if it has a uh, expiration date, it tries to steal some extra time. Yes, sir, sir. So the enemies of God, which are the rulers of this world, 40 years ago we would just say it as the white man. That's right. mm -hmm. But unfortunately 40 years later that white man has infected oh, yes. persons who don't look white. That's That's right. 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 So you have right. those that are strategically placed in positions of power right. who right. may be white or they may be black, yes, but they have the mind of Satan. Right. 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 So we're talking about the rulers of this world. We're talking about the enemy of God. We are talking about a people who are the Caucasian people that Allah only gave a specific amount of time to exist and to rule while they exist. Right. They are a global minority. Exactly. We are taught in our lessons when you come into the nation, as I hope uh, our presentation today helps you make that decision, if you haven't made that decision already, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know my, there's a hook in this whole presentation. <laughs> I want to bring you into the body of Christ, as we say in the that's church, but right, right. we'll really become a part of a community of people who are divorcing themselves from the wickedness of this world. That's right. Mm. But we are taught that the original black man outnumbers the Caucasian 11 to 1. We learn that upon entry into the nation of Islam. And his time expired in 1914. Well, one of the signals that his end has arrived is the presence of God and God raising a messenger from among the people. And they then follow that by planning to destroy that messenger so he cannot awaken the people that they have put to sleep. Right. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says the ultimate aim of this world that we live in, I don't care what you hear them say, remember what you heard today that the ultimate aim is to murder the messenger of God and thereby to keep the people of God from arriving at their God-given destiny. Right. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says the ultimate aim of this world should be known to everyone, especially the righteous. Yes, the arch deceiver's ultimate aim is to do as their people have done, try to destroy the preacher of truth and those who believe in him. Not just the preacher of truth, but also those that believe in him. Again, strike the shepherd right. and scatter the flock. We are angry that this flock really represents our replacement, in other words. Right. Black man, you are the replacement to the modern white man who rules the world. That's you are his replacement. That's your That's destiny, right. to be a ruler, but not a wicked ruler like he has been, not following his model. Hmm. 
but to follow the righteous model because you and I have a righteous nature. So he wants to destroy you from arriving at your destiny. And there's a man that comes into the world that helps to bring the people at the destination of their destiny. This was the aim of Cain when he slew his brother Abel, and the aim of the dragon when he sought to destroy the woman, parentheses, messenger, as it is written in Revelation. I remember as a, as a short aside, student minister down there, hearing the minister talk about how sometimes the messengers of God, when you find them written in scripture, they are metaphorically or symbolically styled as women. Right. And I was happy to find this quote because to see that the minister was in harmony with his father, which he always is. Yes, sir. And if you think that Minister Farrakhan is in conflict with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it's because you haven't studied the Honorable Elijah Muhammad deep ahead. enough. Go ahead. Go. So whenever you think there's an apparent contradiction, go a little bit deeper. Yes, sir. Because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is a man that was prepared in the womb of his mother, as the scriptures say, and I knew thee while you were in the womb of your mother. And I think that's fitting and true. Because a servant of God, a messenger of God among a people, his function, if you were to describe it, it is largely maternal in nature. Right. Jesus and Muhammad and these kinds of servants, one ending the Bible, one ending the Quran, they have a love for the people. They nurture the people. They are real shepherds. That's right. In Islam, there is this concept of a community called Ummah. But the root of the Ummah is Um, which means mother. Because a community, a community of righteous people, it has a nurturing effect. We remember the old African proverb, it takes a village or a community to raise a child. And we go out into the black communities today, and there is no village anymore. There is no nurturing environment. And if an environment shapes heredity, well, if you want to explain the bad be behavior that you see in our people, look at the environment that's nurturing us. Minister Farrakhan said many years ago in a self-improvement study guide, that community stewards the life force in your and my children. Right. But our enemies have created an environment that corrupts and manipulates that life force again so that you and I who are the people of God would not arrive at our destiny, which is to be the cornerstone of a new kingdom. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad from December 14, 1973, Muhammad speaks. Among a lot of brothers, this is a very popular book, The 48 Laws of Power. Robert Greene, who wrote this book, he talks about this strategy. Strike the shepherd and scatter the flock. He said <clears throat> one resolute person, one disobedient spirit, can turn a flock of sheep into a den of lions. That's intriguing because scripture talks about a lion being asleep in Judah and who will wake it. it says, do not waste your time lashing out in all directions at what seems to be a many-headed enemy. Find the one head that matters, the person with the willpower or the smarts or most important of all, charisma. Some of the critics say, well, Farrakhan, he just, his power is in his charisma. He's just a charismatic leader. Mm -hmm. Robert Greene goes on to write, finally, the reason you strike the shepherd is because such an action will dishearten the sheep beyond any rational measure. Now, our history has been something, beloved brothers and sisters. <laughs> We've had a hell of a thing to happen to us. The transatlantic slave trade. Yes, sir. See, just the middle passage. You could just stop right there. Right. The horror on the boat ride over here is of epic proportions. Right. Never happened before to any other people. 
people often like to be dismissive when we talk about slavery as a precursor and a cause to much of what is taking place in black life today. They say it was slavery everywhere. But in truth, the slavery in America, at a certain point, its evil was such that they didn't call it slavery anymore. Mm. They began to refer to it as the peculiar institution. Because the world and onlookers looked at what America was doing in mastering, in the making of a slave, the end product being a Negro, three-fifths of a human because he was robbed of the knowledge of himself and robbed of the knowledge of God. In other places around the world, the slave, slavery really amounted to debtors' prisons, prisoners of war. If you ever get a chance to read a book by Olada Equiano, he was a slave, and his story or his narrative is unique because he writes and describes life as a slave in Africa, and he contrasts it against life as a slave in America. He was a slave in Africa and a slave in America. I said, man, that man had a rough life. <laughs> but when he wrote about his experience as a slave in Africa, he said that while I was a slave in Africa, I was considered to be a part of the family. I ate what my masters ate. I dressed like my masters dressed. My time of service had a beginning and it had an ending, and it did not extend to my children or my offspring. He said but when he came into America, it was altogether different. <clears throat> so we, we, we need to really peel back the layers and look at this thing when people want you and I to be dismissive of our Holocaust, right. but they always forcing their Holocaust down our throat. Right. Right. That's right. <clears throat> if six million Jews died, okay, well, let's put it on the scale. Right. Every time I see the old iconic picture of the Lady of Justice, she has a scale, right? meaning she's weighing things. Right. Okay, six million, we're sorry for your loss. But a hundred million or six hundred million black people, go ahead, go ahead. and we still have yet to be restored go ahead, go ahead. Right. or reformed <laughs> or even given reparations. No, we can't be dismissive, beloved brothers and sisters, That's of our right. Holocaust. That's right. And in that struggle and in that sojourn, Allah raised up great ones among us right. who reflect streams of thought and approach to getting freedom, justice, and equality for us. And I thought about the great ones that have come among us, and many times people try to make a distinction between a prophet and a social reformer. Right. They are those that in some Muslim communities, they have some respect for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, for instance. But they depart when we say he was a messenger of Allah. They say, well, he was a social reformer. Right. You know? Well, I'll take that. Because who can truly reform a society? if they don't do it with the power and the permission of Almighty God, Allah. So you think you're diminishing him, but you're not diminishing him at all. Right. In fact, if you read the Holy Quran, Allah says this, had we not risen up men to repel other men, the whole earth would have been overrun with evil. Come on. Now wait a minute now. Is it not the revolutionary strong leaders among the people who rise up to repel and fight against oppression, colonialism, and imperialism? So when I read that, I see Allah taking credit for the presence of the strong black leaders who came not necessarily in the line of prophets and messengers, but then again, they came from God right. with a divine purpose. Right. And they are also worthy of our honor and respect. Yes, sir. It is a lot that rose up a man like Dr. King, right. Marcus Garvey, Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, a sister like Harriet Tubman, right. Sojourner Truth. 
They didn't just have a bright idea. You know, I think I'd like to suffer and be ridiculed and mocked and endure persecution. No, they were raised by Almighty God, Allah, mm -hmm. to repel mm -hmm. the evil that had come upon the lives of his people. So in today's modern culture, what has become a norm is the mockery, the ridicule, and the mischaracterization of the great one. You can't like Booker T because the story about Booker T, well, you know, he was an Uncle Tom. He right. was just trying to get along with white people. Right. When Manning Marable put out his book a couple years ago on Malcolm, you know, in a rare occasion he begins to make accusations about Malcolm's sexuality knowing that there were generations of young black men who looked up to Malcolm. Right, right. His autobiography is one of the most widely read books in America, particularly by young black men, who as Malcolm went into prison, we are going into prison. So we saw him as an example, perhaps, of a way out. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, well, you know, he killed Malcolm. He was that dirty old man. Come on. You go all over the country, you see, commercials and posters during Black History Month. And they'll tell you about everybody. I'm always amazed. Mm -hmm. They tell you about everybody, Minister Donnell. That's right. They go and get Jan Matziliger, who developed the manufacture of shoes, and Lewis Latimer and the light bulb, and everybody, even go back to Africa. But you never hear about a man right. that was referred to as the most powerful black man right. in America. That's right. right. That's something to think about. Yes, it could be Black History Month, yes, and you are never given any history or knowledge right. about a man that white people call right. the most powerful black man in America. Right. Now the old saying goes, you know, you can tell a lot about a man by who his enemies are and what his enemies have to say about him. And yet we remain to a large extent powerless. And don't you think if there was one among us they had some power, you know, the intelligent thing would be to plug into him. All right. All right. Because in electricity, when you plug in, you're able to get the same power of the source of power. Huh? But you don't never hear nothing about him because they want you and I to believe that was that dirty old man. Huh? All right. All right. Dr. King. Oh, well, you know, he, King was great, but he was an adulterer. This is what they tell you about our great one. All right that we've already established emerged from the ranks of a suffering mass of people by the permission and inspiration of Almighty God, Allah. Paul Robeson died being branded as a communist. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has had to suffer wearing the scarlet letter A for anti-Semite. And more on how they treat our leaders, our shepherds. Right who all had an approach to solving a problem that has not been solved. That's right. And this handling of them gives more credence to the notion that these are men and women of God. Because if you look at how the Bible, for instance, you know, the Bible and the Quran primarily discuss the same prophets. Right. The Quran gives you a few more, maybe Shu'ai, Hood, Sally, but Abraham, Jesus, Muhammad, Jonah, both in Bible and Quran. Right. But the Bible being a book that was tampered with, the biblical writers saw to uh, highlight what are negative circumstances in the lives of the men of God. When you come into the Quran, Allah says that all of his prophets have no sin. <coughs> Why did the Bible writers give you all of these sordid details about the lives of prophets and messengers of God? You don't find that in the Quran. Allah says they are sinless. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they didn't do what the Bible writers said they did. Neither one of us can know if they did or they didn't. But in the eyes of Allah, their service to him and to the people that they were raised among, caused him to do what he said he would do to all believers. 
blot out their sins and their transgressions. Throw their sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Right. But when you have people like King James and others, uh -oh. who was openly a homosexual, right. King James Stuart the first of England, I know we were all nursed on that King James Bible. Yeah, that's right. But that's just a historical fact. It is what it is. He was a homosexual. And so he translated a Bible. He used 47 translators. Part of their instruction was to translate the Bible in such a way that the truth in it would be difficult to ascertain. Right, right, right. Use ambiguity. And the instructions we see also in how they handle the lives of God's prophets and messengers. There's even striking of the shepherd and how the Bible handles the prophets and messengers of God. Mm -hmm. And so it's no wonder that they handle God's revolutionaries among black people in the same way. J. Edgar Hoover in the modern context in some of the COINTELPRO memos. He said COINTELPRO had this purpose. COINTELPRO, for those, I know everybody in here is familiar with that term, but just for those that may not be, it's an acronym for Counterintelligence Program. And it was a long-running program of the federal government. Now, the FBI, their focus was supposed to be on, you know, protecting America against, you know, those that would threaten America and its safety and security. But what happened was J. Edgar Hoover was a Shriner, a Muslim Shriner. He was a man that had a keen knowledge of Quran, of prophecy, and so he looked at black people in America, albeit through that lens. See, we have to stop in the black community thinking that racism is bereft of intelligence and wisdom. Right. The hatred against you and me is not the trailer park version of white trash, if you will. Uh -huh. As we'll talk about it here shortly. But let me, let me read this. The purpose of this new counterintelligence endeavor is to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize the activities of black nationalists, hate type organizations, and groupings, their leadership, spokesmen, membership, and supporters. See, they call black love hate. Just to be clear, yes, any organization that want to do good for black people, they say, well, you're teaching hate. Because in the mind of the oppressor, see, he's always taught us to hate ourselves. But he understands that if he has been our enemy and we begin to love ourselves, it follows that we can't love that which hates that which we love. Right. I right. hope that makes some sense. Right. 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 If you love yourself and there is that which is the enemy of yourself, it's really a natural result that you have to hate that that opposes what you love up to and including your own self, your own life your own kith and kin. You can't tell me you hate my wife and then I love you. Come on, huh? I know we may have thought like that in our days in religious abuse. We've been abused in the name of religion, beloved brothers and sisters. And that's just a reality. We were given a doctrine, something doctored, something concocted, not for healing. Right. But that which would facilitate us enduring the horrors of slavery by having mental detachment, living really a life deferred. Anybody got student loans in here? You know about deferment, forbearance, all that kind of stuff. I don't want to be clear you understand what I'm talking about. You like to defer the payments on a loan. But now imagine a slave. See, don't you worry about this suffering cause there's a heaven in the sky, and there's going to be a land of milk and honey and joy and happiness in that great yonder. Well, that is kind of helpful to a slave to go through something, because you can kind of go through something if you think there is light at the end of the tunnel. So that abuse in religion, 
It didn't go into Ecclesiastes, for instance, where the Bible writer said there's a time and a season for everything. Oh, right. There is a time for love and there is a time for hate. God hates. Come on. Yes, sir. He gives the wicked mercy. But if they don't change their ways after the mercy comes, then he visits them right, right. with his right. terrible yes, sir. wrath. Right. That is to be feared. They said the Bible said the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Hmm? Yes, sir. So I know I just want to say that about hate. <laughs> the pernicious background of such groups, their duplicity and devious maneuvers must be exposed to public scrutiny where such publicity will have a neutralizing effect. Efforts of various groups to consolidate their forces. That means unite. <coughs> so when the black Christians and the black Muslims want to unite, J. Edgar Hoover said frustrate that. Make it difficult for them to do. If you ever get a chance, you want to watch a good documentary, there's a good documentary that was produced by HBO some years ago called Bastards of the Party. Excellent documentary that traces the history of Los Angeles and the war on drugs and the emergence of the Bloods and the Crips. The title comes because from the perspective of the producers, the Bloods and Crips and the gangs throughout America were like the bastard offspring mm. of the nationalists and civil rights organizations that were destroyed by J. Edgar Hoover. Now what's fascinating about what is revealed in this documentary, you talk to one of the brothers who was a part of the Panthers. Come on. And in the, on the West Coast, the Black Panthers, uh, led by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale and others, they were a group that were very powerful. Then you had a group called Us that was presided over by Ron Karinga or Dr. Maulana Karinga. And they just had different approaches. One emphasized doing for self and armed self-defense. Another one emphasized education, cultural re-identification. But the FBI, they found out, were writing letters one to the other, threatening the other. Right. And the brother, you know, he said, we never would have thought, you know, that a group of black people trying to organize themselves in a little city mm. would be infiltrated. Right. by the most powerful law enforcement agency in the world. That's what is difficult to get many of our young people to see and understand. We are out here in these streets and we are killing one another over petty reasons, right. having no respect for life, right. over colors, over territory that we don't own right. because someone threw the wrong side. And not realizing that in our little group, in our little set, in our little organization or gang, there are agents, there are provocateurs who are on the payroll of the American government. Right. Don't allow them to recruit the young. Because if you're an organization and you can't reproduce yourself, that means in the future you won't exist. Right. Well, student Mr. Donnell is right. Our efforts today are after our youth. Right. We're not going to let the devil have our babies. That's right. If there's anything worth fighting for or dying for, it is for your women and your children. Right. I was up late watching uh, TV and working on these slides, and the movie came on 47 Ronin. I don't know if yes, you've seen Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent film. You know, one of those soldier kind of films because it reminds you that, yeah, life is good, but life don't mean anything if you're not willing to give your life for something that is more valuable than your life. Right, right, right. America promotes this idea called rugged individualism. And it deceives us into thinking that the most important thing in life is ourselves. Self is certainly value. We should respect self and preserve self and maintain self. But self individual fits within self that is community and nation. Right. So we have to now, part of our awakening, 
as black men and black women is to now begin to value one another as extensions of our own self. Right, 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 right. right. That's one of the reasons all Christians need to allow that Islam is the perfect religion for us. That's right. Because the fundamental principle of Islam is that you cannot be a Muslim, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, or a righteous person, unless you want and love for your brother or sister what you want and love for yourself. Right. That's fundamental. Right. We say in the nation of Islam, our praise is to Allah. If all I have is a bowl of soup, half of it is reserved for my brother. That's right. Now. Let's move a little quickly. Why is Satan's corruption of the people of God? Have you ever read in the Bible where it says, and they took the gold and the silver vessels Come of on. God and they defiled them with strong drink? Yes, sir. Now that is the metaphor and symbolism of King James and Shakespeare and the translators. And if you like literature like I do, it's beautiful. But when you're trying to read a book and just get the truth of it, give me the straight dope, man. Yeah, that's right. right. That stuff is kind of confusing because the mind goes to wealthy people drinking out of golden goblets and silver flasks. And I said, well, why would God have a flask? I, I thought he didn't want us to drink alcohol. Yeah. Well, God is certainly no alcoholic. Right. But the gold and the silver vessels of God is not something that you drink. It's a people right. that are defiled to keep them from the fulfillment of a divine destiny. Right. That's the work of Satan. Right. He wants to corrupt us. You and I, we have a righteous nature, a righteous essence, a righteous core. And here's a news flash. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Right. <laughs> Thank God. Yes, sir. Allah says in the Quran, set thy face for religion. Being upright, not low down, but upright. Right, right, right. The nature made by Allah in which he has created men. But here's the sweet part. He goes on to say, and there is no altering Allah's creation. Man. So I don't care what we've done or what has been done to us. That righteous essence remains. Yes. Right. That righteous essence in truth is really the object of what the scriptures describe as the resurrection. And that's the reason why all God ever does to help the people resolve their issues and their problems is to give to the people a man and a book. A messenger and a message, a prophet and a prophecy, a warner and a warning. Right. Because through hearing the word, the essence can be touched. It can be stimulated. It can be awakened. Hollywood oftentimes likes to depict it. Sometimes you see a character. He's in the valley of decision. And there's an angel on one shoulder and there's a demon on the other shoulder. But both of them look just like him. Uh -huh. mm. And sometimes the angel is very weak and frail. Right. But the demon, he's muscular. He's strong. This describes the condition of you and I because even though we have a righteous nature, there is a duality of nature. Right. We have a righteous essence. But if you feed the appetite, if you feed our carnal desires, right. We can become corrupted, and our righteous nature diminishes in its influence over our thinking. Right. So in the process of the resurrection, you have to open your mind up to receive a word that carries with it new ideas. Right. It carries with it and is the transmitter of the spirit and energy of God. Right. And the more you feed it, the more you water it, it begins to awaken and grow. And before long, it is the righteous part of self that dominates the self. Right, right, right. Good teacher. Let me move on. Y'all all right? Yes, yes sir. sir. I got me excited in class. Come on, <laughs> Again, I mean, 
it's a heck of a thing to have as your enemy one described as the arch deceiver. Now, you know, we tell them, you know, what they call white lies or whatever. Well, sometimes we may have a lie that, you know, where, you know, we don't, are not telling the truth, but we're not an arch deceiver. One that is an arch deceiver, inscribed as an, uh, described as an arch deceiver, he's the master of deception. Right. And I respectfully submit, brothers and sisters, that's who our enemy is. Amen. He's the arch deceiver. He is a wise saint. He's a strategic saint. Right. He's a scientific saint. Satan is wicked, but again, that don't have nothing to do with about his intelligence. Right. Right, right. He has great intelligence. So much so that the Quran says, and know that Satan sees you from whence you see him not. <laughs> but that should tell us right there, he's a pretty wise fellow. Right. If he can see you, but you can't see him. And we can bear witness today in the modern world because cameras are everywhere. Yes. That's right. You know, he listens to our phone calls, yes, follows us on the internet, right. opens our mail. He is, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches, right. the universal snooper. Right. Yes, sir. But listen to what the Honorable yes, Elijah Muhammad yes, says. He says, the white man of America is well informed through his scientists and scholars who are paid just for studying the problems of prophecy mm. and especially the future destruction of America which he knows is fast coming. Mm -hmm. His greatest mental burden and physical strain at the present time is how to prevent the spread of Islam among his ex-servitude slaves in the last days. Mm. <coughs> One of these days we're going to do a whole presentation on what the government has studied and learned about you and me. Because while we're busy getting high, in the club getting wasted, doing nothing with ourselves, our enemy is studying us. Right. That's right. You will never be able to win against one who is studying you if you don't study him. Right. That's right. That's right. right. That's right. So Islam, we know characteristically, is a religion that emphasizes knowledge. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said this, one learned man or woman is harder on the devil than a thousand ignorant worshipers. Right. If you're going to fight Satan, you've got to increase your knowledge. You can't just go in the corner and pray and wish evil away. That's right. No. Again, God gives to the people a man and a book. Right. Not just a man, but a man and a book. Come on. The hidden message is, is that through the proper education, through the acquisition of the right knowledge, you can oppose or escape the enemy and his tricks. From the Bible. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. When, when I read that, think about what I said earlier about being outnumbered 11 to 1, mm -hmm. black, outnumbered white globally. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say, come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating because as much hell as black people catch in America, you think white people would really want us to leave, but they don't. Right. 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 They want us to stay and be tormented. Right. Mm. But this is a verse we should reflect upon and really memorize. Because most of the issues of today are wrapped up in this one verse. More numerous. You wonder why when the subject of family planning comes up in the black community, it revolves around contraception right. and birth control. When they talk about family planning in the white communities or in the suburbs, it revolves around the subject of fertility and adoption. 
One group that is white have more money. They are encouraged to have as many children as you can. Y'all yes, remember John and Kate plus eight, right? <laughs> See, what happened with that is that when they do the in vitro and the fertil uh, uh, fertility treatments, it's so expensive that they normally will fertilize many embryos or many eggs at one time because they have to factor in most won't make it. Right. So they hope maybe two will make it. So John and Kate were something of an anomaly because all eight survived. And in my own speculation, it was because John was not completely 100% white. He looked like he was mixed with some Asian. So I think that that affected that all of them came to church. Same thing with the Octo mom. She wasn't like 100% white. So they all came to church. But when it comes to Keisha and Tyrone and Mookie and Ray Ray, they situate a Planned Parenthood in your neighborhood. Even the parents say, you don't need to be having all them children. And some of it is out of ignorance. Some of it is born out of the fact that they don't want you to reproduce yourself before you can provide for the right, life right. that you bring into the world. We understand that wise counsel. But there is an agenda in the higher positions of power. And it's global. Right. You come to find out when you look into foreign policy, many nations around the world, America say, well, if you want aid from us, you have to do X, Y, Z as a list of demands. And oftentimes it involves controlling their population, reducing their numbers. And see, we don't understand that it's because the white power structure globally is outnumbered already. So they want to reduce the numbers of black people, brown people, yellow people. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Join our enemies. We talked about yesterday how the enemies of America are always so-called peoples of color. She's hardly had a hot war where she put boots on the ground against a European or white country. Right. Her and Russia, all they did was just talk noise to one another for 50 years. Nobody did anything that constituted an armed conflict. Right. The wars were in Vietnam, Japan, in Central and South America, against the Native Americans, against Cuba, against Grenada. When Bush came out with the axis of evil, what was it, Korea, Iran, and Iraq, was that the axis of evil? How come there were no white nations in his axis of evil? See, that's important to know because that's your family. We're taught in our lessons, we thought the only people we had were the ones here in North America. <clears throat> but you and I are international people. Some of you can go in and mix in Mexico right now and nobody would know the difference. Right. Some could go in Africa and mix right now, nobody would know the difference. You could go into the Caribbean and just blend in. You could some could go into Asia and just blend in. Because that's your family. And our enemies know that their family are our international enemy. So if they, we go to war with them, they're not going to side with us. We've been their oppressor. They're going to side with their enemies and come against us and leave this country. Shrewd, let's look up shrewd. I'll make up for yesterday and not defining smite. Let's define shrewd. An important term, because again, evil does not equal ignorance. Shrewd, acute, astute, calculated, calculating, canny, clever, crafty, cunning, discerning, discriminating, far-seeing, Far-sighted, fly, slain, version. intelligent, keen, knowing, long-headed, perceptive, perspicacious, sagacious, sharp, sly, smart, wily, as in the wiles of Satan. So now, 
you and I, we are being dumbed down. Right, right, right. While our oppressor is very intelligent in his efforts to control, corrupt, and exterminate us. So never again, I remember Brother Donnelly, people used to be talking about, oh, George Bush, he's so ignorant, he's so stupid. Well, I heard Minister Farrakhan say this, a wise man can pretend to be a fool, but a fool can't pretend to be a wise man. <laughs> Muhammad Ali perfected a tactic called rope a dope. Right. He played like he was being abused and injured. Oh, man, you wear me out. You're about to win. But I'm just preserving my energy. And I'm getting it right ready. See? So we thought that a man, now let's think about it for a minute. This man gets himself elected to be the president of the United States. Me and you living paycheck to paycheck and in a barbershop talking about, look at how dumb he is. Yes, sir. By saying that, we reflected how dumb we were. Now, this is going to shock you. I want to talk about their efforts to corrupt us. You know that crack and cocaine has been a scourge among our people. Right. How do we start using cocaine? Well, this scholar, Richard Harvey Brown, listen to what he has to say. He says, employers in the South had made a practice of supplying their black workers with cocaine. According to another writer, Ashley, plantation owners had discovered things went better with coke. Mm. Thus, they kept a steady supply on hand to increase productivity and keep workers content. Cocaine was also a cheap incentive to maintain control of workers. A shrewd boss doling out one quarter gram a day per man could keep 16 workers happy and more productive for a full seven days on a single ounce. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. It's important information. Yes, sir. All of us have been touched by drug addiction. And those that are addicted to narcotics, you'll notice they handle a lot differently than those that may be addicted to alcohol. You can go to your employer and say, I, I, I'm an alcoholic. And, and, and by law, they had to let you go to rehab and you keep your job. Mm -hmm. But if you're on crack, the same rules don't apply. Right. That kind of addiction is criminalized. One is treated as an illness. But when we go back and look at the history, see, this is one of the reasons. See, most of us don't know this. But this is one of the reasons why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said history rewards our research. What's the reward? We understand what happened to us. And I maintain this respectfully, beloved brothers and sisters, until we understand what happened to us, we will look at one another and draw the wrong conclusions. You have to have a thorough knowledge of self. And that includes how were we destroyed? Right. How were we set at naught? Because they want you and I to believe that it was of our own doing That's right. to perpetuate this idea that we are cursed. And that there's nothing, if God curses a people, then only God can remove his curse. Right. Ain't no use of trying to fix your life. Ain't no use of trying to better your people because we've been cursed by God. Mm. So let's pray. Let's have church. See, and through Jesus, mm. white Jesus, we can live. Come on. Be born again, Lord. Wash me white as snow, Lord. Mm. And when our people say that, we're not talking about to be clean and free from impurity. Right. We're talking about being free and clean from our blackness right. that we consider to be a curse. Mm. And a lot of people think that this is old hat. Mm -hmm. But go online and watch they did. There was a brother who was a friend to the Muslims back in the 60s. Uh, I forget his name. But he did the doll test. He was right. a professor. Right. 
and they brought dolls in to black children. Oh, right, right. Yes, sir. And they put black dolls in front of them, white dolls in front of them. Right. And they asked them, which doll do you think is pretty? They pointed to the white doll. Mm -hmm. Which doll do you think is <coughs> ugly? They pointed to the black doll. They did this in the 60s. Well, NBC did it a couple years ago. Right, you can watch right. it on YouTube. Right. I used to have it in this presentation. But you can watch it on YouTube. Yes, sir. They did this just a couple years ago. And this time, they brought in black children and white children. Mm -hmm. And they all had the same reaction. Mm -hmm. The white children th thought the pretty child was white. Mm -hmm. They thought the smart child was white. Mm -hmm. They thought the good child was white. They thought the black child was bad, ugly, and unintelligent. Mm -hmm. And when they asked the black children, they felt the same way. Mm -hmm. And the thing that breaks your heart is the final question that they asked the black children. Which one of these children looks like you? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Watch it sometime on YouTube. And you can see in a child's mind the thinking. The one child that's ugly, that's bad, that's huh. unintelligent, that child looks like me. And this is in the 2000s. Yes, sir. When we think everything is all right, it's right. all good. Yeah. We can intermarry with one another. Right. We can live in white parts of town. We got rich celebrities and entertainment. Hey, we got a black president. Mm -hmm. Y'all Muslims, man, y'all stuck in the past. Oh, kind of, y'all are race baiters. Mm -hmm. That's what they call us. Right. No, we are those that will not ignore the obvious. Right. We will not ignore that our people mm -hmm. suffer from self-hatred. That's right. Even globally. Yes, sir. That's right. I, I read stories where that bleaching cream right. is a top oh, seller yes, in right. Africa, mm -hmm. in India. Yes, in Jamaica when we left there. Yes, sir. I was it was a That's top seller right. in the Caribbean. That's right. Not yes, yesterday, today. Yes, right. Yes, sir. So the message of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is critically important yes, today. Right. Knowledge of self is critically important today. How do they want to corrupt us? Popular culture is a tool. I don't know if we can make that slide bigger. You may not can see it, but... This is too short and very wise. Now I'm going to read this, and I hope you can read it, because it's very revealed. You know, when people name names, mm -hmm. that's important. Yes, sir, sir. He's not talking about the record industry. He's naming specific individuals. Mm -hmm. And I said that we should do a more extensive interview with him to see how much he's willing to detail, because the record industry, the movie industry. See, our babies, they're not in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and the junior FOI and the junior MGT. Their main influence comes from popular yes, culture. Yes, they know Little Wayne. They know Nicki Minaj. That's they right. know NeNe and Drake and Justin Bieber. That's their prophet. Those are the prophets of the young people. They don't know Moses, Abraham, Jesus, and Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, Minister Donnell. <coughs> Too Short says, and I'm not going to blame this on anybody. He doesn't have to, I will. <laughs> but I was actually being pushed. I had to show you he's a little fear, you know, because he's going to tell you what other people did, but say, I ain't going to blame nobody. Okay, all right. And I'm not going to blame this on anybody, but I was actually being pushed into a direction where I would talk to people at Jive Records. I would go talk to the president, Barry Weiss, and he was like, I always wanted to do these side projects like the Easy e E-40 duet, which was one they never would let me do. Jive would never let me and E-40 do an album together. Now, hip hop here is no E-40 and Too Short Oakland. Right. Bay Area, mm -hmm. they, are, they together. So it makes sense that they would do some type of collaborative project. Right. Kenneth Clark, thank you, brother. Kenneth Clark <coughs> was the brother that did the original doll test. And he was a friend of the Muslims. I've heard some people say that he was a part of the nation. But I know uh, Cedric X. Clark 
was a professor who was a part of the nation. You don't know him as Cedric X. Clark. You know him as Dr. Naeem Akbar, but uh, a great one of the professionals that was produced by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know how they always try to say, well, the Muslim, yeah, I only can attract people that don't know no better. Yes, sir. Elijah Muhammad be brainwashing people. He can't, he can't brainwash nobody with a high IQ. Mm. Well, if I had time, I'd show you some of the Muslim physicians and doctors, yes, sir. some of the professionals over history, Minister Donnell, as he was interviewing all praises to the Lord, was talking about the great ones that sat at the foot, yes, at the foot yes, of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as their master teacher. Yes, and the world has not been able to handle his students. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now the thing that is not often mentioned is that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was taught by another man. Because he only went to the fourth grade. See, that's the beauty of it. It can't be made up madness. Right. Because Elijah didn't even have the requisite right. fundamental knowledge to create what he ultimately taught to black people. Right. Right. Where would he have gotten it from? Right. Right. If they say, well, this is a fraud, then you have to say, well, what is it a fraud of? Where did I get the information? Right. He's the only one that claims that Master Fahd Muhammad was his teacher. Uh -huh. That's right. And those of us, just watch, read the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's writing. Come on. And sit down and watch the news or read a good newspaper. Listen to the developments that are taking place in science and technology. And day by day, what he said yesterday that people mocked and ridiculed. Now science is bearing witness that it is in fact the truth. Right, 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 right. All right. I remember reading of a conference that was being held at Harvard University by a group of people that have organized themselves into something called the caloric restriction movement. And they were charging $5,000 to participate in the conference. Caloric restriction is another way of saying what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wrote, that the less you eat, the longer you live. In other words, eat one meal a day. Right. Final call, I think, was selling that book for $5. Right. They were charging 5000 to learn what they know that they got from Elijah. I was at the mosque just a couple weeks ago, and a brother brought me a book. One of these health gurus, Dr. Oz type people had written, literally called Eat to Live. Right. They got a website as well. Some of you have probably seen it. And when you open it up, he showed me, he said, one of the chapters is digging our graves with our forks. <laughs> like, come on, man. We should probably sue him, but you know, if you want to give the people wisdom, give credit. So credit is due. Anyway, back to the story at hand. <laughs> this is what Barry Weiss told too short. They kept making excuses so we could never do our project together. I also wanted to do an album that was filled with songs like The Ghetto, Life Is Too Short, Money in the Ghetto, I Want to Be Free. I wanted to do a whole album of positive too short songs. Right. This is what was in his heart and mind. Yes, sir. Uh, just to keep that balance, and he said, I had made a verbal deal with Barry Weiss, where he was like, right now would be the perfect time. You should just do like the raunchiest two short album ever. The album cover, the songs, just do a dirty effing two short album. This is the executive running the company advising me just to put out an entire album of just cursing and sex. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. See, the minister has said that our athletes and entertainers, they are our natural resources. Right. <laughs> but like the Earth's natural resources, right. we don't control them. Right. right. <laughs> so in his heart, that righteous essence was like, I need to do something positive. Hmm. But the evil executive was like, no, we want you to put this out. The, the, just the filthiest thing that you can put out. 
Now you would look at this man if you saw him out and about with his three-piece suit on and right. his briefcase. And now well, that's an upstanding businessman. Right. You no, know, probably a professor or right. a real estate executive. Not knowing that his satanic mind right. works to create filth that's right. to corrupt the minds of your and my children. Right, right, right. right. Yes, sir. This man talked about the mentality of those that is in the record and the movie producing industry. Author Robert McChesney. He said, you should look at it like the British or the French empires in the 19th century. Teens are like Africa. There is this range that they're going to take over. And their weaponry, listen, their weaponry is films, music, Books, CDs, internet access, clothing, amusement parks, sports team. That's all this weaponry they have to make money off of this market, to colonize this market. And that's exactly how they approach it. So they look at music as just one small part of it. They aren't music companies, they are money-making companies. And music is a weapon that generates money for them. Let that sink in for a minute. See, because we would say films, music, and CD, that's entertainment. Right. I just like the beat. I just want to go and see this movie, and play this CD. But this man that is a uh, industry critic and in writing about the entertainment industry has identified that the mind of the colonial masters who colonized Africa and everywhere there were dark people, that same mind is running the entertainment industry. Right, 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 right. right. So music is now a weapon, not for truth and righteousness but for the corruption and the destruction of the minds of a people that God want to use to build a new world. It's Christmas season. All right. Yes, sir. I think one of the carols says, and done we now our gay apparel. Mm. La, 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 la. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, somebody took that lyric and they wrote a book, but it ain't about Christmas. Come on. It's about the influence of homosexuals in fashion. Mm. Mm. One of the things that was striking to me as I read it is this highlighted portion. It says, for many gay men, the adoption of gay dress styles by heterosexual men marks the importance and the relevance of gay culture. Gay style actually sets trends. It's what people take fashion from. Tony asserts, and Joe Pop, these are people they are interviewing, confirms this opinion stating, apart from a few things, gay culture is basically what becomes straight culture six months later. Yes, mm. That's the reason why I haven't bought a suit in a long time. Yes, sir. All of the suits on the rack, they real like the skinny kind of suits. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not because I'm not skinny. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but if you look at how it's styled, it's a high crotch area. Yes, right, right. The pants are skinny. Right, right. About that. And they try to make a man a heterosexual man right. look like a homosexual man. Right. Right. And certainly this here that we see every day. Uh, I saw a brother the other day, it was cold, and he was sagging, and he had like a, I guess a, a blank, a coat or something, in the, you know, in the middle part. You know, because there's his clothes, and then the, the, if it was warm, it would be his underwear. But you could tell he had insulated himself. I'm like, man, that's like, you know, perfecting wickedness right there. Right, right. You know, it's like, okay, you won't even adjust because of the temperature. Right. 
you mm. still going to say it's cold, so you're going to put an extra layer on underneath it. I'm like, wow. Now, some of you have heard a quote used by Minister Farrakhan. This quote is actually found uh, also in Message to the Black Man. It was by one of the Virginia delegates in 1832. He talked about the process of dumbing down a people. Yes, sir. Henry Berry says, pass as severe laws as you will to keep these unfortunate creatures in ignorance. It is in vain unless you can extinguish that spark of intellect which God has given them. Sir, we have, as far as possible, closed every avenue by which light may enter their minds. We only have to go one step further to extinguish their capacity to see the light and our work will be completed. And they would be reduced to the level of the beasts of the field and we should be saved. Mm -hmm. Now this is powerful white people mm -hmm. admitting that they consider their safety resting in the fact that black people remain ignorant. Right. So when you and I become wise, they get afraid. Right, 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 right. right. And that's something to really reflect on. As long as you and I are in an ignorant state where we're always wilding out, you know how they say, turn down for what? Right. And white people are comfortable. But when mm. you and I get intelligent and notice the use of the term light. See, there's all different kinds of information. Right, right. But it is the wisdom of God that is often referred to as light. Right, right, right. And he said that we are not satisfied by cutting off the avenues of light. Mm -hmm. That goes to, again, striking the shepherd. Right. Yes, sir. Kill those that are the bearers of light and prevent them from teaching their own. Write laws where they can't read and write. Right. Yes, sir. But he said, we want to go a step further. Because in case that that we've done to cut off the avenues, what if one of the avenues that we thought we had closed really is not closed, right. and light gets in, we want to make sure that when light comes in, their minds have no capacity to perceive it, accept it, adopt it, and internalize it. Right. Mm. So this goes back to how they shrewdly deal with us. Right, right. As consciousness rises among us, the impure forms of narcotics are circulating. Mm. Right, right. That's right. That's right. Now heroin has come back into the black community. Crack came in the AIDS. Right. Well, that's significant. Right. Because the 80s is the first decade of the rebuilding of the nation of Israel. That's right. 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 Yes, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he was in the rap music. Right. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was on the college campus. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was in the highways and the byways. Right. And that that our enemies thought they destroyed right. in 1975. Right. right. They right. saw it once again. Come on now. 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 Let's make it, when he teaches them, it's very difficult for them. Right. They'll be too high. Right. They'll be addicted. They'll be destroyed. Huh? Smiting the shepherd and scattering the flock. You also have the prison industrial complex. I teach often in prisons. 
I always try to inform brothers. I said, this is new slavery. This is a new plantation. Uh -huh. My great sister, who is a professor in this city, Michelle Alexander, mm -hmm. wrote the book, The New Jim Crow. And uh, she'd be someone great to speak at an event in this community. I don't know if she has uh, done much with the mosque here, but her book is very popular in institutions and around the country because she talks about the modern prison industrial complex and how the war on drugs and all of these various forces converge to unjustly place millions of black men in prison. The 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution literally makes slavery a perpetual alternative mm -hmm. when you have been found to be convicted of a crime. Right. Again, the arch deceiver. You and I think the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. Right. right. But he put right within the very thing that abolishes slavery, that which guarantees that slavery in another form will always be in existence. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the 13th Amendment said neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except, except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have duly been convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Congress shall have no power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. In other words, once you're convicted of a crime, you are legally, according to the Constitution, a slave. It's not an exaggeration. It's not a conspiracy theory. That is according to what you and I both just read. Right. 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 So if slavery still exists in another form, how come we're not outraged? Mm. Maybe we've been dumbed down. Right. right. Hmm. The Bible. Talk about law for a moment. The Bible says in the 94th Psalm, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with you? that which frames mischief by means of law. They gather to themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense and my God and the rock of my refuge. See, a throne of iniquity is a government of evil right. who do their evil by creating laws that are against the life of the righteous. Now, we already established the black man and woman of America are by nature righteous. Right. And everybody's outraged at the laws today, but we forget the laws that were created to help us be slaves. Right. Law has always been against us in America. There were special laws for us called the slave code. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad references a book called The American Slave Code in Message to the Black Man, written by a man named William Goodell. In it, you should get it and read it, because you get a chance to see the laws that your and my ancestors had to live on. Well, every aspect of black life was criminalized. Right. Now, if you want to talk about that which is a predictor of behavior, the laws under which a people are subjected are one of the major predictors of their behavior. Right, right, right. right. Mm. So look at these laws that we were forced to live under. Slaves cannot marry. And people wonder why we want to shack up today. Mm -hmm. Because in order to be a husband to a black woman used to be a criminal offense. Right. Yes, to be a wife to a black man used to be a criminal offense. Right. Slaves couldn't constitute families. You could have a little wife out in the slave quarters, but if the master desired your wife in an amorous kind of way, you had no right 
to resist him, and neither did she have a right to resist right. him. We had no ability to protect our women mm -hmm. in this country. Right. Education was prohibited. It was against the law. Punishable by fines. Right. It was punishable by fines if you were found educating a slave. Yes, sir. Frederick Douglass said, education unfits a man for slavery. Mm -hmm. Slavery and ignorance don't go together. Right. Because right. 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 knowledge is always a liberating force right. in the life right. of the people. Slaves could not have the free practice of religion. But again, you know, people say, well, y'all always digging up slavery. Slavery ain't got nothing to do with these N-words out here selling dope and drugs and won't take any children, blah, 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 blah. Right. Okay. Let's look at what science has to say. Mm -hmm. There's a new field of study called epigenetics. <laughs> Very fascinating. Epigenetics is the science of how the external environment affects us at the molecular level by altering gene expression and function that can in turn be heritable. Right, come on, come on. It refers to chemical modifications or tags that mark specific genes around the intricate DNA complex. These modifications can alter gene expression, influencing our biology and function. Think of a tag as a volume control knob that signals the gene to turn up or turn down come on, come its programmed on. function. Our genes listen for cues from the environment, right. such wow. as the food we eat, the kinds of milieus where we live and work, the circumstances of our birth, and the race and class interactions we share with one another. These factors in part determine how genes respond in ways that expose more vulnerable populations to disease. Human wars, famines, droughts, plagues, physical and emotional abuse, and other forms of social deprivation not only leave their mark on society in harmful ways, but they also wreak havoc deep within the cells of our bodies. The cells react to stressors in the larger social structure at crucial developmental times in the womb that have an influence on the human health later in adult life, leaving us more sensitive to our environment and susceptible to disease. To make the long story short, Come on. that that happened to your and my ancestors yes, is alive and well in our genes. Right. That's right. Hmm. And when the environment keys in, we exhibit certain behaviors that they exhibit. Yes, sir. Hmm. Very, very critical connection between the behavior or the misbehavior of black people today to our experience in slavery. Right, sir. When to read was criminal, to marry was criminal, to be educated was criminal. Well, we had no legal access. We couldn't constitute families. We right. were the property of our master. That experience lives within us, science says, on the cellular, on the molecular level. Right, right, right. That's the <coughs> deepest part mm -hmm. of the human being. Yes, sir. Smiting the shepherd to scatter the flock is so that <coughs> character assassination can make a physical assassination very, very easy. Right. See, when they go to war, if you notice, they have to give the soldiers a certain psychology in order to kill their enemy. So the enemy, they're ragheads, right. they're chinks, they gooks, Mr. Charlie. Because as a soldier, you can't see your enemy 
as a human being right. like yourself. Right. That's right. With a wife, with a mother, with a father, with children, with aspirations to send their children to college or to open a business. So you have to affect his psychology in order to get the soldier amped up to kill him. So you have to assassinate the character right. of your enemy. Demon. So killing your enemy is that much easier. And that is behind strike the shepherd, scatter the flock. Right. You know, in current events, all of these brothers been in current events mm -hmm. for various reasons. And it's like everything that's wrong with America is the fault of the black male. Right, right. Because the black male is the greatest threat. Why is he the greatest threat? Because the male of every species carries the germ to continue that species on into the future. Demographers long time ago had determined that if population growth continues among blacks and among Hispanics, then in America by the year 2050, white people will be a minority. So you become the new ruler without firing a shot. Right. Just through making babies. Just from continuing your population growth. For many of us in the black community, they say that Hispanic population growth is continuing. In the black community, ours is flatlining. Right. Because we don't want to have children anymore. And oftentimes, our health is so poor where I teach at, among our young brothers who are incarcerated, is very sad. And many of them in their early 20s. And because of the life that they have lived, they've totally destroyed their health. Right. <clears throat> I remember my great grandmother, you know, down south and had become sick with different maladies and whatnot, I had like a bag of prescription meds. We've seen our grandparents with their bag of medication. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. You know? Well, I'm here to tell you, there are some young black men with bags of medication like that. Kidneys gone. Hypertension. Diabetic. So the new ruler is all but on his deathbed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the media, black, these black men, they're being physically assassinated on the right. These black men over here, they're being character assassinated on the left. Right. That don't excuse none of what they may or may not have done. Right. I don't know. Come on. I haven't investigated their crime. Mm -hmm. But I know that most of all media in this country is controlled by only six companies. That's right. That's right. Many of them Jewish owned. That's right. And they have an agenda. Come on with it. It's not just reporting. Right. There's an agenda. Right. There's a goal in mind. Right. There's an editor in the in the newsroom. Right. 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 That says what can go before the audience right. and what can't go before the audience. In the aftermath of the Million Man March, we in the Nation of Islam noticed <coughs> that there became a blackout right. in major media against the Honorable Minister Lewis Right. Harvey. Right. right. Why did that happen? Come on. That happened because they had tried two strategies. Mm -hmm. Well, they had tried one major strategy. They weren't going to try the other strategy. <laughs> they weren't going to say good things about the minister. Right, they right, just right. were not going to do that. <laughs> and you and me, <laughs> the more they talked bad about the minister, wait, wait. when he came to our city, wait, wait. that made us come out right, by the wait. tens of thousands. Yeah. Right. So the enemy learned that old tried and true proverb that every knock is indeed a boost. So by the time the Million Man March came, they say, well, we with the message, but we not with the message. Right, right, right. That's crazy. Ironically, yes, sir. We love the message, but we don't like the message. Mm. And almost two million black men came out. Come on. So after that, they say, you know what? I don't care if Farrakhan come to Columbus, Ohio, and 40,000 black people come out. 
CBS is not going to cover it. ABC won't cover it. NBC won't cover it. So I have literally had this experience that some of you may have had. I have co-workers or friends or family I haven't seen in a long time. And they say, man, how was Pyro right, playing? Is right. he all right? Yeah. Right. 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 Yes, sir. And they wonder where the minister is because they used to follow him from the periphery, just seeing him on news. And so they think because the news ain't covering him, he's not no longer doing anything newsworthy. I said, but the minister is fine. He just completed one of his most prolific years ever. He preached every week. 52, 58 weeks. He's back touring college campus with all praise to the Lord. Because they want to, if they can't destroy him with media, they're not going to allow media to help him. Right. So now the media is assassinating the character of the object <coughs> of God's love. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so much terrible weather. Come on. Because if these brothers, they may be, have done some bad things, but they were made in America. Made right. in America. As the minister said at Morgan State, we have been the white man's protege. Right. We've been his little apprentice in the workshop of evil. Right. He's been our mentor, our tutor, our guide. Right. We forget about the casting couch phenomenon in Hollywood. Mm. If you're a female actress, it was a given. If you wanted a certain role in a movie, you had to perform sexually for either the director or the producer or both. Mm -hmm. That's a world. That's an environment right. shaping the traits of a people who live in that environment. Right. And we say that these are our, this is our entertainment industry. That's a heck of a society where they are entertained by the violation of the laws of God. Right, right, right. Let me move on. But it comes up out of the scripture. Pharaoh and Herod, they had the same idea even though they were thousands of years apart. Pharaoh gave the order. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Herod, when he realized he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. See, black men are from where the Messiah, he will be a black man. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he comes from the womb of a black woman. Mm -hmm. So if the Messiah who comes into the world, he comes not as this, you know, we have the pictures where he's so nice and right, loving, right, 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 right. but he's one that comes anointed by God right. to crush and to destroy evil. Right. <clears throat> so the Practitioners of evil, Satan himself, has to attack him even from birth. Right. But the process that he used ensnares or kills many, although he's really only after one. Right. So he casts a wide drag net of murder, mm. trying to kill the deliverer of the children of Israel under Pharaoh trying to kill the Messiah among the children of Israel under Herod. This man, we say, is Allah's messenger Messiah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. He's called the most powerful black man in America. His student, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, is called the last man standing. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, as Minister Abel pointed out last week, where the Messiah was concerned, not only was he attacked when he was 
in the womb of his mother. But as Jesus' work among the children of Israel became prominent, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, his enemies not only wanted to kill Jesus, they also wanted right. to kill Lazarus. Right. In the modern context, the black man that is awakening from his sleep, the white man wants to kill you because he can't tolerate you again awakened, educated, right. alert, alive. That's right. He fears you will remember and learn right. of what he has done to master you. Right. He has, as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan stated, <clears throat> the mind of Cain. Right. You remember Cain said in the Genesis, after he killed Abel, now every man that sees me will slay me. Right. And that's peculiar. Because you can only be slain once. Right. <laughs> so that's not the words coming from the mouth of an individual. Right, right, right. That's words coming out of the mouth and the mind of a people who killed another people unjustly that God had found favor and approved of. So the Jews said, we're going to kill Lazarus. They said, we're going to kill Jesus. <clears throat> the Holy Quran gives to us a parable of three divine messages. We wind it down. Three divine messages who all fulfill aspects of what Jesus is described as doing in the New Testament. Right. Not just one, not just two, but three. Let's read the Holy Quran as we close. Surah 36, ayat number 13. And set out to them a parable of the people of the town. When apostles came to it, and we sent to them too, they rejected them both. Mm. Then we strengthened them with a third. Mm -hmm. So they said, surely we, all three of us, are sent to you. Right. Huh? <laughs> they said, you the only black men, I mean mortals like ourselves. God ain't revealed nothing to y'all. Y'all just lying. They said, our Lord knows surely we are sent to you. And our duty is only a clear deliverance of the message. Come on way. I close with this. It looks bleak, but Allah has given to us three who fulfill the work of the Messiah. That's right. And even though our enemy is trying to kill all of us, I close with this parable of our deliverance from the book of Ezekiel. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start at the top. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of dry bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? When I read this and you see dry bones, I want you to replace dry bones with black people right. in America who are dry, meaning that when a bone is dry, when something is dry, it's very brittle, easy to be destroyed, very uh, without any life in it. Right. So this is describing the condition of our people today. He says, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. 
I will make breath into you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I was prophesying, and there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. <coughs> I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the winds, or prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, wind, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered into them. And they were complaining, our hope is gone. We are cut off. They started talking about Trayvon and Mike Brown. They started talking about Eric Garner. Wind whipping on the valley of the dry bones. And at a certain point, the Lord says, I'm going to open up the graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open up your graves and bring you forth from them, this is not talking about a physical grave. It's talking about a mental grave of people who have been mentally destroyed. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. And then that people stood up, an exceedingly great army. This is the prophecy of you and I. Right now, the violence that's taking place, the open season on black men in America, those are winds whipping us after 80 years. <laughs> After 80 years of three divine warners among us, That's right. teaching us, ministering unto us, loving us, guiding us, organizing us, but after 80 years, we still want a sweetheart with our enemy. Well, just as Ezekiel preached unto the dry bones, and they wouldn't do what Ezekiel had said they should do, on behalf of God, God said, now let the winds whip on them. And I'm encouraged because of this prophecy. Because it looks bleak, but Allah has already worked out our salvation. Right, 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 right. He's already worked out our salvation. So we invite you today with us, beloved brothers and sisters, to join us in helping to build a nation. Help us to stand up the valley or the dry bones in the valley and make a nation out of our people. I pray to Allah that what we've shared have been a benefit to you and your growth and development. Yes, sir. I leave you as I came before you in the greeting words of peace and paradise of as Come on, brother. Come on, Man, Ford is hard out. Come on. questions here. If brother, you would remain there. You can come around here and join me if you'd like. Um, how many of you are here for your first time? For those that are here for their